I am super pumped about today's show. We are having one of the great players of all time today as our guest, none other than Tom Watson himself. Listen to the accolades that accompany this man, his career and his life. A member, of course, of the World Golf Hall of Fame, 70 professional wins to his credit, 39 PGA Tour wins amongst that, that puts him in the top 10 all time. He has an eight time major champion. He's won twice at the Masters. He won the 1982 US Open. He won five times at the Open. A four-time United States Ryder Cup team member in 1977, uh, 81, 83, and 89. He had a 10-4-1 a Ryder Cup record, by the way. He's a two-time United States Ryder Cup captain, a 14 PGA Tour victors to his credit, uh, PGA Tour champions, including six senior majors along the way. He's an accomplished, of course, golf course architect, including a redesign of Bally Bunyan's Cashin course, which if, hopefully if we'll get time today, I'll talk to him about that, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, the work he's done with the first tee and with kids these days is second to none. I want to talk to him about that as well. His new initiative is called Watson Links. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Tom Watson to the show. I guess the first question I want to ask you, Tom, is how are you feeling? How are you healing up? Well, thanks for asking. Uh, it's good to be on your show, Matt. I, uh, I've been rehabbing my shoulder here for quite a long time. I had a little problem with a go-kart for my grandkids and turned it over and stuck my arm out and had to have it replaced. And, uh, it's, it's been quite a process, but it's getting better. Uh, I'm playing some golf and uh, I'm getting ready to uh, go down to Texas, ride some uh, practice on my horses to get ready for a show the following uh, you know, following month in late April. Uh, I will be going to the Masters and looking forward to that. And actually, I'm going to present, uh, be presenting the trophies at the drive, chip, and putt contest that uh, Augusta right. National puts on nationally. Fantastic. That sounds like a lot of fun. Those are a lot of subjects that I definitely want to touch base with you on. I am curious... Knowing you, what did you do during the period in which you were really rehabbing? I mean, it's not like you to sit still. Were, were you beside yourself <laughs> at a time when you just couldn't do anything else? Well, it was, it was mainly rehab. You know, I was just you know, sticking with the program and trying to, trying to uh, get the range of motion with my arm uh, uh, to get better uh, and the strength to get better. Uh, uh, but you know enough enough of uh, talking about my injuries. We let's uh, let's talk about golf. Definitely. Now, part of the golf that I love to talk to you about, but this is another thing that sometimes in, in you and Jack Nicklaus are very si similar in this regard. When you when you look back, you guys are so forward thinking, and it was cool to see your enthusiasm. Talk about getting back on the horses again, etc. But have you started to allow yourself time? to really reflect on the glory of what you accomplished. I'm curious where your mind goes if you do. Honestly, I don't look back. I'm just looking forward in my life. I've got, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I did, you know, golf was great to me. I, I, I achieved, uh, uh, I, I, tra I achieved uh, part of my dreams uh, or most of my dreams of, of being, being a heck of a player, uh, won some major championships. Had some great contests with Jack, uh, and uh, played on the Ryder Cup teams, captain the Ryder Cup teams. Uh, you know, golf is uh, such an integral part of my life. Uh, but but there are other things in my life, you know, with relationships and and uh, the horses and the things that uh, I'm carrying forward to, uh, uh, to when I make my final putt on the 18th hole in my life. When you and I have had the, the pleasure of talking about it in the past, talking about your background, talking about where you came from, talking about your home, I remember you've told me that among other things that your home was a, was a place of music. Um, I, I'm curious about how you feel like your childhood, your upbringing, the community that you are from, how that lent itself to helping to later define who you would become. Well, I had a, I had a great set of parents, mom and dad, uh... Uh, you know, they, they raised their sons, uh, I think the right way. They raised them with a lot of jazz music, uh, the big band sound, the, uh, wonderful, you know, wonderful sounds of, uh, Errol Garner and, uh, Charlie Bird and, 
uh, you know, in, in the big bands, I remember you know, being played at the house all the time. Uh, but, but, you know, they also uh, introduced me to a lot of things in life. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I guess you might say golf. And when I was six years old, my dad put a golf club in my hand, showed me the grip, said, son, this is the way you grip it. You, you, you see knuckles on your left hand and, you have, and you, your V should point to your right shoulder. And, you know, that's kind of a hook grip in today's lingo, but uh, that's how I started. And then uh, I, he, he gave me the opportunity to play golf. Now, he, he's a member of a, of, of a country club, and I had a chance as a kid to go out and play by myself, play with other kids, but more importantly, play with my father, who taught me, he taught me the etiquette of the game, but he also taught me how to play. And, you know, that's a, he, he really mentored me uh, uh, as most of the pros on the tour will tell you that their father started them in the game of golf. And, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do right now with our, our program here in Kansas City and, and expanding it out nationally. It's called Watson Links. And that is to give kids the opportunity to go play golf with a mentor on a golf course. And you know, we're, uh, we're, we're going forward very fast with this. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, you know, continuing on this program and expanding it so that we get more kids to be able to get the access. They have free access to play, get on a golf course and play with somebody who knows how to play and knows, uh, knows the game, just like I did with my father. That's the, the whole point of this program. What, what are the virtues, do you think, Tom, uh, from the game of golf that carry over into life lessons that you hope to impart to these young people? Well, I, I think a lot of it is, uh, uh, is owning up to your good shots, uh, but more importantly, owning up to your bad shots. And it's just like life. You're, you're, uh, you're not going to hit great golf shots continually and, and playing golf. You're going to hit some bad shots. So how do you deal with those bad shots? How do you deal with a, a bad round, a bad tournament? Uh, uh, you know, that's the you know, it's, it's same thing in life. How do you deal with the, the roadblocks that um, you, you face in life? That's, you know, that's what the game of golf, I think, teaches more than anything. Watsonlinks.org, folks, if you want more information on what we're discussing with the legend right now, Watsonlinks.org. Have you guys been able to see tangible results from these efforts with Watson Links where, I mean, obviously, you know you're going to impact lives. What's it like when you start to see those results coming back and realizing you're helping kids realize with higher aspirations, they can go to school, they can get work. There's lots of things that they can do that maybe they thought they couldn't previously. Well, that's what the game of golf does. You know, I, I've been a very big proponent of the first tee program and getting kids started in the game, learning the game. And uh, they teach them the nine core values, which essentially, if you look at it, Matt, that's the etiquette of the game of golf. That's how you, that's how you act on the golf course. You know, you don't yell in somebody's backswing. Um, you, you stand at a certain place, you, uh, you know, you replace your divots. Uh, you know, things that uh, just normally you have to do. And uh, the game, uh, the game really teaches you a lot of life skills. What's interesting about that, Tom Watson, is that we live in a world that I think arguably you, it could be said that there is a diminishment of civility. And yet through the game of golf, you're able to impart these lessons to young people that really they're going to carry with them for the rest of their lives, obviously, but they're also going to be able to benefit from them. I think people who watch golf, they, they respect that. They respect the way that the players on the 18th hole take off their hats and shake the hands of their fellow competitors, the person who just beat the daylights out of them or won the tournament. Uh, and that's, uh, that's just part of uh, uh, you know, respecting your, your fellow man. You know, what's interesting with that is when you think about when you made your way, when you came out on tour, the first, if you say the first golden age with golf, which arguably would see Hagen, Sarazen, Jones, and the, the second golden age would be defined by the, the great American triumphant, right? With Byron Nelson, who I know you knew very, very well, Ben Hogan, uh, Sam friend. Snead. And, and you, came, you came in at a time when that, those latter gentlemen were still alive and active. And I think that's fascinating to me that you played through an era where you saw stars that are still 
talked about today and those that were of legendary mythical status now. What was it like for you having those kind of people as mentors? Well, let me specifically uh, address my great friendship with Byron Nelson. Byron, uh, if he wasn't the greatest ball striker and player in the world, I don't know who, who else would, uh, you know, would, would take this place. You know, he won uh, 18 tournaments in one year. He won 11 in a row. Uh, he retired early from the game, so he didn't continue to play in the meat of his career. And matter of fact, Byron, with all the wonderful times I spent with him, uh, he, he said, you know, Tom, I was a better player when I was 50 than I was when I was in 30, you know, the late 30s and 40s when I was winning everything. And that, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, to me, uh, just being around him to hear what he had to say about the game, how he had to play the game when he, he said he grew up poor as a church mouse and you know, money was, was a big, big deal back then. You know, he, he had barely had enough money to stay in the tour. He won, he won some money uh, out in California and basically uh, that, that, that allowed him to continue to play in the tour. Uh, but uh, the wonderful, just the wonderful stories he had about his life, the, the players' lives uh, when, when they, they drove in caravans and car caravans rather than going by hmm. private jeans. Most of the pros do today, it seems like. Um, yeah, you know, you know, they, they struggled, but they loved the game. You know, they absolutely loved competing and playing the game. Uh, I, you know, those stories, uh, when I go to the Masters, uh, to the past champions dinner on Tuesday, on Tuesday night, uh, it, you know, early on in my career, when after I won the Masters in 77, I had the opportunity to go in and sit down with Gene Sarris, with wow. uh, you know, Claude Harmon. Uh, with Byron and with uh, and, and with Sam and with with those players and listen to their stories. So uh, I was a I was a golf historian. I read about you know them and and their exploits uh, in, in books. Uh, Down the Fairway by O. B. Keeler was a, was a uh, it was the Bible to me. I love that book. Uh, but uh, to listen to their stories, it, it gave me an understanding of what they went through. And, and a foundation for my career. Uh, when I came out in the career, uh, I looked up to Arnold Palmer. I looked up specifically to Jack. Uh, but there were players out there, Gene Littler, Julius Boros, uh, uh, Don January, Miller Barber, uh, those players right there that I looked up to. And, you know, when you're, when you're a kid on the tour, you, you want to impress these players so that they look at you and you said, yeah, kid, you can play. That that was my goal. Is to yeah, kind of get it, get a nod of a affirmation. You can play, and uh, mm -hmm. that's. Uh, that, I don't think that's. Uh, I think that's universal with anybody coming out in the tour. They want to impress the players that they they watched and uh, they know were the great players. They want they want their affirmations. Incredible, uh, it, it, the whole thing. I mean. Kid, you did play. I mean, it's unbelievable the stories and the names that Tom Watson was just sharing with us. I have a chill running right up my spine. Uh, Tom, when, when we talked about your background, when we talked about your upbringing, when we talked about your mentors and the people that you looked up to and your desire to impress them, was it always part of your nature to have a very, very high work ethic? Were you self-motivating in that regard? Without a doubt. I, I came on the tour and I didn't have a clue if I was going to ever make a birdie. Uh, matter of fact, uh, when I went to the qualifying school, they put it down in Palm Beach Gardens in Florida. Uh, I started out to play six rounds to try to qualify for the tour. And the very first hole I played was a par five and I birdied it. So I got off to a, a, a good start and I qualified for the tour, got on the tour and, and failed uh, a number of times until I finally figured out uh, to, you know, a way to trust my swing. And that was kind of the late 1976. And, and I took that, uh, that swing thought into 1977 and, and, uh, uh, my career really blossomed after that. But, you know, my, uh, my start on the tour was, uh, uh, it was uncertain, but I did know one thing. I was going to practice harder than anybody out in the tour. And I don't think anybody did practice any harder than I did.
it's fascinating, isn't it? Because those are back in the days when you guys didn't have easy access to coaching or any type of technology to help you to know what Video. your face angle is, the position. Yeah, videos, et cetera. And, and we had to pay for our practice balls. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Uh, Tom, when, it, what's remarkable, first of all, I, I have to note to people in case that they're not aware of your specific uh, career and when you started to win your major championships. When Tom Watson says that he found something in his swing around 1976 that carried into that remarkable year of 1977, which I'm going to talk to him about in just a moment, uh, consider the fact that this man was already a major champion by that time. It, it speaks to just how remarkable it is that he has achieved what he has. Uh, from those early days on, how were you with sleeping on a third round lead coming into the final round? How did you sleep that night before? I slept longer, but I, I dreamt more. It, it, I didn't have a problem sleeping, but I dreamt more. I remember that. Good dreams? <laughs> Nobody remembers their dreams, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although we do have our nightmare dreams, don't we, Matt? We have our, uh, you know, I, 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 one dream I had was always, uh, it, a lot of it, it, it reared its ugly head where I was putting up a hill and the ball, if it missed the cup, would come back at me. It would, come, it, would, it, would it, was, it was like, uh, uh, actually, when I was a kid, I used to practice in the, on the carpet at home. We had this little device, a little, basically a, a metal metal, uh, you know, uh, 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 device that had a hole in it and you, you put it along the carpet and it'd go up to the hole and the ball would return to you. But if you missed it, the ball would go up and then come back at your feet. So maybe that's, that's what instigated my nightmare dreams about being on the golf course and the ball came back at me. I had to you make know, it for it not to come back at me. That's the thing. Oh, well, that is tough. But you, but you were great with your, with, as, as a young man, you were very aggressive with your putting. I don't think I've ever had a chance to talk to you about that in all the conversations that we've had over the years. Uh, was that natural to you, that instinct that you were going to go for it? And if, if you missed, you, you, you knew you would make it coming back? Well, the one thing that, uh, you know, you rely, I relied on when I was you know, a young player and um, it was my putting. Uh, I, I was a great putter. And I, and so, you know, if I, if I knocked it three feet by or four feet by, I knew I was going to make it coming back. Uh, it's not that way anymore. In the last half of my career, it wasn't like that. When we were talking about inspirations and mentors to you, you had told me in the past that Bruce Edwards made you better, not only as a golfer, but as a person. What did you mean by that? Well, Bruce was the, he was the uh, a man, he, he carried my bag for you know, some 30 years on the and what I loved about Bruce was his attitude. He never was down. His glass was always half full. No matter how badly I was playing, he was there cheering me on, kicking me in the butt, trying to, you know, trying to get me out of my, off my pity pot. Sometimes you get, you get mad. Uh, yeah, I got mad quite a bit when I wasn't playing well. Uh, he said, come on, let's get it done. You know, I, you know, you know and, I go, I go to the uh, you know, 17, 70s first hole at the, at the U.S. Open to Pebble Beach. I'm tied with Nicholas in the last round, and I hooked my two iron into the left rough. And I walk off the tee with Bruce off to my side, my right side, and I say, well, that's dead. And he said, no, come on, let's get this thing up and down. And, uh, and that's Bruce for you. And fortunately, I, you know, luckily, I chipped it in. When you chip that in, this is such a great story. When you chip that in and you proceed to dance around the green, you were pointing. Were you pointing at Bruce and what was that for? Well, to continue the story, when he got up to the ball, the ball's left of the green, probably 15 or 16 feet from the flag. It was, the ball was in the rough and I had to hit to a down slope. So I had to hit the softest chip possible. And uh, I knew, I knew what I had to do, and, and that was just, you know, just try to hit it as softly as possible. So I took the sandwich out of the bag, and as I was doing that, Bruce said to me, he said, get it close. And for some reason, I said, get it close, hell, I'm going to hold it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I did hold it, 
and I, you know, I, I raised my hands. I ran around the green. I turned around. I pointed to Bruce and I said, see, I told you I was going to hold it. I love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, you also came from a generation that I don't think I can't think of any of you that have ever told me that you used a sports psychologist. Maybe you had, you know, the Bruce Edwards of your life or, or someone else that who, who was a shoulder that you could lean on. But where did that where did the toughness come from from that generation, I guess, is the way I would want to ask it, that you just you guys were out able to figure it for, figure it out for yourselves out there. Well, I'll tell you a little story that uh, it makes you tough. Uh, I was sitting in the locker room at the Colonial uh, Colonial Country Club playing in the Colonial Invitation. I just had a good Friday round, and I was sitting in there, and Julius Boris was sitting behind me, and in walks, uh, 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 oh, yeah, let me let me think about it, Chichi Rodriguez, and Chichi, Chichi, uh, he was he came into me and said, Tom, you're what a great round of golf you played. I think I shot 67, 300 par or something like that. And, and then he started kind of effuse over me. He said, yeah, you're playing so good. You're a great player and all this. And Boros in the back of me said, yeah, I'd like to have all the money you pissed away. And it, it, it took me back just a little bit, but he was right because I'd had a lot of opportunities to win on the tour and I failed. I mean, I, I, I couldn't finish the deal. And, you know, that's the old guys. The old guys in the tub, you know, putting you, you know, on the tour, putting you in your place, and you know that's that's how tough they were. You know that that was uh, it wasn't a joke. He just was making a making a, a, a very accurate comment, and I took that as as exactly that. It didn't offend me. It just said, you know, he's right. I've got to do better. I've got to I've got to learn how to win, which I finally did. It meant in many many times at that since you brought up colonial i guess it's a it's a perfect time for me to ask you about how well did you know ben hogan did you get much of an opportunity to spend time around that legend well i i never pulled off or watched ben hogan uh, hit a golf shot but uh, i did have the opportunity to uh, uh you know, have lunch with him one time uh, back in the middle 80s and he I had the opportunity to ask him a couple of questions there at the end of the lunch, and he was just as gracious as possible. Just uh, uh, we had, you know, we just had a wonderful conversation. And so I asked him the question. I said, "How nervous were you when you played in competition?" And he looks at him. He, that smile stopped like this, and he got serious. He said, "Tom, I was so nervous, I was jumping out of my skin." And I said to myself, "Wow." Yeah, if this is the, the ice man, the guy that showed no emotion, that no, that it was, who, who people said uh, he was, he was a rock solid under pressure, which he was. When he said he was that nervous, uh, I took that to heart. And when people asked me how did I kind of learn how to you know, play under pressure, I learned how to play under pressure strictly, you know, strictly by experience, by putting myself in positions to to win uh, under pressure. You're always under pressure when you start start a tournament, uh, but when you get when it gets down to uh, at the end of the tournament when you have a chance to win, the pressure increases, and some people can handle it and some people can't. And I learned that you know, a couple things I needed to do to keep that pressure level from getting above the boiling point, and a couple things were breathing. You saw me on the golf course yawning. I'd be going. like that. Why was I doing that? Because I wasn't breathing. I was sh my breathing was shallow and I wanted to get air in my lungs. And when you do that, and I tell people this when they're under pressure, whether they're riding horses into the show pen uh, or any other type of pressure situation, I said, use uh, your breath, your breath control to relax you. And you can do that. Take two or three big breaths and then you can you know, just do it and you can feel the tingling down your arms where it just it relaxes you. And that, that's, that's, that's one of the key elements of me learning how to deal with pressure. What Does that go hand in hand with what you told me previously, what uh, Lord Byron had told you about also trying to just, like when you yawned, it kind of brought this up in my mind, uh, Tom, about just trying to slow everything down? 
You've, you've done your history. Uh, Byron did say, you know, said, he told me one time, he said, Tom, I, I play fast like you, but I learned that if I can just walk a beat slower, just a step slower uh, when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm playing, that helps slow my rhythm down. So I'm not, I don't go as fast uh, with my golf swing. Been honored to have the company of Tom Watson, a member of the World Golf Hall of Fame, an eight-time major champion, six more times a major champion amongst the PGA Tour champions ilk. And, and this is a man that continues to give back in so many ways, not only with his opinion, which he's happy to give, but also with boots on the ground. Uh, WatsonLinks.org, uh, an absolutely fascinating concept that he has to use the game of golf to help young people be around people of accomplishment and understand the possibilities that exist in their life. Uh, with, with Watson Links, uh, Tom, how, did you conceive this concept? Did someone bring it to you? But how did you get so enthusiastically on board with this? You know, over the years, Matt, I've, I've created a foundation to, uh, to uh, basically do one thing, and that is to create lifetime golfers and to create lifetime golfers uh, with kids in mind. Uh, here in Kansas City, we started a Clubs for Kids program. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that evolved into another program, which was kind of the precursor of, of the First Tee program. Then the First Tee program came on board. And I was a big proponent of that to get kids learning the game. Uh, but there was always a missing element there to me. How do you get the kids from the Watts, from excuse me, the, uh, the practice tee to the golf course, playing with somebody like I played with with my father to give them uh, the, you know, the, the understanding of how to play the game. How do you play, how do you make that putt uh, from, uh, you know, four feet downhill? Uh, how do you read a green? How do you hit the ball out of rough? How do you hit it off an upslope? How do you hit it off a downslope? Uh, how do you hit it out of a bunker like this? Um, and, and have real golf course experience. And, and if it finally dawned on me, you know, the program like uh, we have now at Watson Links is, is the way to do that. It's the missing link is to get kids uh, who don't have the ac necessarily have the access to playing golf uh, or especially not playing golf with, with somebody who knows how to play and loves the game with a passion uh, to get out in the golf course with those people. Uh, you know, I get back to the way I grew up. I, I, I want to give back to that in, in the same sense that my father took to passion and the love for the game, how to play it uh, and, and how to act on the golf course. Uh, you know, kids today, uh, they, if they get started, they want to know how to play real golf. They want to know how to act on the golf course. And our with Watson Lynch program gives that opportunity to these kids. WatsonLinks.org, folks, for more information. I want to jump back to 1977 at that Masters uh, because you referenced the year 1977, and it was so remarkable for you and for the world of golf for multiple reasons. Final round, through 16 holes, you are tied with Jack Nicklaus. Could you take us through with your memories what you did on that Sunday on the 17th hole? What was the edge? Before the, uh, uh, the 17th hole, I was uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I was going neck and neck with Jack. Jack birdied 13, I birdied 13. Uh, Jack birdied 15, I birdied 15. We're still tied. And I'm nervous as a you know, cat on you know, a hot tin roof. And I get up to the 16th hole, and I had a choice between a five iron or a six iron. And I said, you know, I'm going to hit a cut five iron right at the flag. I'm going to go right at it because I was feeling very confident about my golf swing. And when I made that swing, I, it was about a three quarter five iron. It wasn't a full five iron. I hit that shot, started right at the bunker and it cut back to the flag. And when I saw that ball, you know, after I felt the shot and saw the ball, the pressure just drained right out of my body, just went like this. And it, it was an amazing feeling. And uh, I played the last two holes under a lot less pressure as I did you know, the, the first seven holes in the back nine. It was uh, so 17, and I, you know, it's like a big breath, 
Uh, I played 17. I hit a drive down the middle of the fairway. I hit a shot in there about 15 feet. And I made the putt. You know, I, uh, the putt went in. I made a birdie. And I said, okay, now I'm one up on Jack. Let's see what happens. And then I get up to the 18th hole. I hit it in the fairway. I walk up to my ball and I watch Jack uh, and the crowd groan. And I said, I looked over there and says, was that for was that for bogey? And they said, yes, yeah, for bogey. So now <laughs> the pressure starts to elevate a little bit more right there, but it wasn't nearly as much as it was uh, on, on, on the uh, front uh, or, or the first part of the back nine. And I hit a shot to the right right edge of the green and, and uh, two putted to win. But that putt at 17 uh, was under a lot less pressure than, than any other shot that the entire day. Absolutely amazing. I'm going to stay 1977 for a second here. I want to go ahead in 77 to the open at Turnberry. It was famously known as the duel in the sun. And the battle that you had once again with Jack Nicklaus over the weekend was historic. It was so incredible. But even as we look at that final round, Jack Nicklaus was through four holes, three strokes ahead of Tom Watson in that final round. And it's remarkable to me because you came back from that deficit against Jack Nicholas. What are your memories from that point? Well, it was a it was a heavyweight fight, is what it was. Jack <laughs> did uh, he buried the fourth hole to, and and uh, was up by three. Uh, then I turned it on. I buried three out of the next four holes to tie him up. Then I bogeyed nine. He buried ten to go two up. Then I buried. 13 to go uh, to go uh, one down and then uh, the big the big happening of the whole day was the putt at 15 from off the green uh, Jack hit a beautiful shot right in there uh, I, I actually I pulled my forearm just to the left of the green but it was up on, on a little hill like this and you know, there's no grass in the golf course so I could put it down this hill Jack hit it right at the flag about 15 feet short and uh, uh, I looked over this putt. It broke about five feet to the right, and I, I knocked I knocked the son of a gun in. And Jack just missed his putt, and and now we're back to even. So we we both par the the, the really tough sixteenth hole, and then the seventeenth hole. Jack made an uncharacteristic error. Uh, he. Uh, he outdrove me just a little bit. Uh, I hit first to the par five. I knocked it to the back of the green. Jack hit a, a four iron and he hit it fat and to the right. It was a terrible shot. And he was off the green and there was a bunch of little moguls over there and he hit this beautiful little pitch and run with I don't know what club, a, a pitching wedge or a nine iron that ran up and down through the moguls up about four feet from the hole. I putted my ball down uh, for a gimme birdie and stood back and watched Jack fully expecting to make the putt, and he missed the putt. So now I go into the 18th hole, one up, and then all the fireworks happened again. So when you get to that 18th tee, and when Jack Nicklaus hit his drive to the right, how close was he with the gorse bushes over there and that? How close was he to a point where he may not be able to even get the club on the ball and what did you expect Jack Nicholas to do at that point when you were safe? Well, I hit a one iron, one iron off the tee down the left side, close to the bunkers, but fortunately didn't go in. Uh, and Jack took a driver and he hit a right to right like this. I yelled four because the crowd was, you know, it's way off, way off to the right. And the crowd kind of parted like this and the gorse was right behind the crowd. And so I, I'm one up, I walk up the fairway, and before I hit my second shot, I wanted to determine what type of shot Jack was going to play. I had to had had to play. So I walked up and I got pretty close to his ball. His ball was in the rough about that deep. And wow. the course was that far to the right of his ball. And it was un, being unplayable. And uh, but I, I told myself, well, he's he's got a swing and the, and the greatest rough player in the world can hit it was, it was about to play this shot. So I, I said, I've got to go back and hit a shot. And I did. I went back and hit a pretty fair shot pretty close to the hole. And, and then I walked up and watched Jack take this mighty swing. Uh, 
out of this heavy rough and that ball came out like this and said only Jack could hit it like that. Uh, you know, there's a big <laughs> swath of grass at the end of his club on the follow through like this. And the ball hit short of the green and bounded up under the green about 30 feet from the hole. And, uh, you know, game was still on. Uh, even though I hit it close, uh, Jack Nicholas in his, his career made more birdie putts than the last hole of a major championship than anybody else in the history of golf. So I had to expect him to make the putt. And when he putted it, you know, 10 feet from the hole, I said, that's dead center. And it was dead center in the hole, made it burn. Wow. So I had to, I had to kind of collect, collect myself, but I was always already prepared. I said, I'm going to have to make this putt uh, before he putted the ball. I'm going to have to make this putt. I wasn't uh, thinking I had to hit it one. He had a 30 footer and I had a two and a half footer. I, I didn't, I didn't say, I didn't relax at all. And uh, when he made the putt, the, the crowd went absolutely ballistic. And it was an air airplane roar, jet engine roar, and it didn't subside. It just kept on going and going and going. And I said, well, the heck with it. I'm just going to putt. I'm going to putt my ball when they're still cheering for Jack. So I went, bent down to, to put my ball down with my mark. And as I was lifting up the, the mark, Jack is like this, puts his hands up. The Class. crowd went silent in about three seconds, only in the game of golf. They respected the game that much. Jack said, all right, let this man have his due. And uh, it went dead silent. I looked at the putt, took my two practice swings, and uh, put it in the right center of the hole. It wasn't dead center, but right center, and uh, won it. And at that time there, Matt, uh, when I walked off the green, Jack came over to me, and he put his arm around my neck like this, gave me a tug like this, and he looks at me. He said, Tom, I gave you my best shot, but it wasn't good enough. And he smiled and he said, congratulations, I'm really happy for you. And you know, at that point, Matt, in my career, that was the probably the biggest change in my career right now. When Jack said he gave me his best shot and it wasn't good enough, I said, now maybe I've arrived and I can beat and play with the big boys. Such a cool, cool story. Incredible. Uh, only a couple more things I wanted to ask you about uh, today, uh, Tom, and then we'll let you go after you've been very gracious with your oh, time. Oh, by the way, I Matt, just before you go, is this yeah. a second? you know what hole <laughs> this is? Uh, that looks like 17 at Muirfield. Where is Try it? Try again. Try again. Uh, could it be 18 at Turnberry? Well, you got Turnberry right. Oh, no, so is that, that 17? The, 17 at Turnberry. That's the fifth hole at Turnberry. Oh, the fifth. That's the fifth. Good thing you guided me on that. It's beautiful. <laughs> I just love this. I love this uh, artwork. Uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous picture. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, a couple, uh, just a couple things I wanted to uh, touch base you on be before we we say farewell, uh, and that is. You are now one of the elder statesmen of the game. And I, I think the game would do well to spend more time soliciting the opinions uh, from people that have been around the game for a long, long time. So I wanted to solicit your opinion. What do you feel about the game at its highest competitive levels right now, Tom? Is the game going in a good direction? Well, the professional game is, is fractured. I think the game of golf in general is going in a great direction. Uh, I, I love the, uh, the increased number of golfers that we see, the, especially the kids and the women who are more, more kids and more women are playing the game. Uh, COVID had a big, big effect on that, but it's still continuing. You know, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's an after effect to it. And that, uh, that's really good for the game. Uh, uh, with the USGA trying to move the ball back, uh, we'll see how that comes. With the fractured PGA Tour and Live Tour, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's really disconcerting. Uh, it, it's hurting the game. And I, I would hope that the powers that be in both parties would get together and, uh, come to the conclusion that it's not good for the game to fracture it and take some of the best players and play in one tour and some of the best players play in the other tour. Uh, something needs to be done. And I hope it's done quickly. 
And Tom, the last question I would ask you today, many, many years down the road, pray, what do you want the legacy of Tom Watson to be? <laughs> Very simple. Uh, when Julius Borrell said, uh, yeah, I'd like to have all the money you pissed away, Watson, uh, that wasn't an affirmation. That wasn't an affirmation that I was a player. I just want uh, my peers to say, you know, that Watson, he was a hell of a golfer. <laughs> Mr. Tom Watson, you were a hell of a golfer. There's no doubt about that. Thank you so much for the time that you've given us. Thank you for what you have meant to the game. Good luck with Watson Links, watsonlinks.org, folks, for more information. It's always a pleasure to catch up with you, sir. Matt, it's always a pleasure being in your company. I enjoyed your show.